Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pruitt, for the very flattering <laughs> introduction. I uh, hope this uh, lives up to your expectations. Uh, please interrupt me throughout, too, if you have any questions at all. I don't want to snowball right past some issues there, questions that you might have. Uh, but John had come to me a while ago, and we had talked about giving a presentation about the strategy and the vision for the CLT and where online learning is going at Thomas Edison State College. So I was brainstorming a little bit on how to approach it, and uh, it's a little bit of a difficult uh, concept to grasp with us because of the nature of our projects. Uh, many of the projects that we take on are multi-year projects, which means that just because essentially we want to start the initiative in year one, doesn't mean that we're going to have full implementation for a little bit further down the line because of the way we handle our courses. Uh, we have students coming into new semesters and new sections every month, which is a daunting thing to implement new technology. So some of the things you're going to hear about, you may have heard about in other venues, um, but they're at various stages of development. Uh, it's also important to point out, too, that the uh, CLT itself, I apologize for the resolution, uh, has only actually been around for about two years. Uh, before that, we were Dial. And uh, Dial was formed, and as you all know this, this narrative, so I won't go into details too much, uh, as the college's original uh, course delivery and course um, uh, engagement platform for students. We were just doing prior learning assessments, and uh, we started out in correspondence style courses, which literally people were using typewriters to create. Uh, and then, of course, things have changed. Now, Dial changed along with that, and as you can see, that uh, we ended up taking on a lot of the necessary operational functions that an online college would take on as it grew. So it grew to be rather large. You know, we had units that were more student-facing involved, and uh, that's the natural creep of what happens. So we went from correspondence, then we went into Blackboard, things like online testing, and it all kept growing. And in 2013, we launched Moodle, which is our new learning management platform. And it's hard to really describe the impact a learning management platform has on a college, um, just because it's so vast, but it's kind of like uh, moving into a new house. Essentially, everything changes in terms of your daily life. That's essentially what happened with Moodle. So your commute changes, everything about how you connect to your other systems change, and it becomes a rather uh, 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 daunting proposal. But we launched Moodle in 2013, which then corresponded with the CLT. And the CLT was, was streamlined down to focus on course creation and quality content generation for the college, as well as building our technological infrastructure in academic technologies. So now we're basically four teams within one unit, uh, instructional technology, assessment development, and instructional design, but also instructional services unit, which takes all the, what we produce and turn it into our semester by semester approach for students. So when thinking this through, uh, I kind of narrowed in on three major themes of what we're planning on doing over the next several years. And the first theme is video and media. The uh, second one being learning outcomes, which I know sounds like a dry topic, but hopefully it won't come across that way when we get to it. And then finally, course design and course collaboration around what we're doing. Now on the first theme, as you can see here, we have several projects under the heading of video and media. Uh, the first one, I, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with, is our Media Creation Studio, which was really made possible by the support of the foundation, and the Martinsons particularly. And uh, as you also know, as you probably walked by, we have a new building. Uh, so on the third floor of a building, we have a studio now, uh, which is outfitted with lights, green screens, all the things you'd expect in a media creation studio. And we're now in the process of acquiring uh, equipment for it, 4K cameras and things of that nature, so we can start recording our own internal learning assets to help supplement our courses. Uh, this is a really smart move because the cost it takes for us to generate our own content is only a fraction of what it takes to buy it off the shelf, uh, which this savings we can offset to our students as well. And it also helps us create more customized pieces for our courses and for our needs. So we're not going to the big players like Pearson and McGraw-Hill and relying on their assets, which also everyone else is using, but also creating our own customized experiences for students. So the intention of this isn't necessarily to come up with full production length videos. This is going to be designed to create videos that are between two and eight minutes length, max. And they're going to be used to supplement our courses. So an example I can give you uh, might be where in the past we would use a case study. And we might get the case study from a textbook. And just for sake of argument, let's just say the case study is about fracking in Missouri. And uh, the case study is what, what typically the student would read it, they'd engage it, they'd go do their own research, come up with their own thesis, and respond. And after a while, that becomes a little formulaic. You know, you do a few courses like that, it becomes a little rote. Well, what we want to do is help add and supplement those particular case studies. So in the case of the media creation studio, we might create our own news piece, which would help 
engage the student at a different level about fracking in Missouri, and then also maybe come up with a piece that, uh, as a contrarian uh, piece about it, that the student can then use as a compare, contrast, and develop your own opinion. And really the intention is to help the student engage more deeply with what's being presented in front of them to be assessed upon. So that's just one example. Now we also have another media studio, which is our one button studio we're going to be launching. So it begs the question, why do we have two studios? Well, the idea behind the one button studio is simplicity. Uh, so essentially the idea is someone walks into the room, whether it be a subject matter expert, instructional designer, whoever it may be, and they literally press a button on a table. And when they press that button, the lights dim appropriately, the shades go down, the camera starts rolling, and every starts, thing starts happening with just one press of a button, which means that if we have a subject matter expert or an instructional designer, let's just say getting in front of the camera is not their forte, and they don't want to go to the studio to have three people helping the man to write one, or compose one piece, this gives them the chance to do it on their own. So a perfect use case scenario for this is that, let's just say we have an SME who's trying to explain a concept on calculus, and they have a whiteboard behind them. They go into the room, they press the button, they can do it and redo it as many times as they feel necessary, and by the time they get back to their office, the, the video component, the video piece will be on their desktop ready to be uploaded to Moodle, which is fantastic. So two different internally facing uh, video initiatives that's more to help design and supplement for our courses. Now we also have a couple of initiatives that are more student facing. Uh, one is Big Blue Button and Live Synchronous Video. This is something that college has never had before because we usually don't ask students to be at a, at a computer at a certain time in a certain place. But as time's gone on and in certain programs like our MBA program, we've started to incorporate these live synchronous events as part of the curriculum. And uh, right now they're being done kind of at the mentor's disposal based on what tools they're familiar with. So some mentors use Skype. Uh, some mentors use um, GoToMeeting or FreeConferenceCall.com. And it's not a very good format for our students because it's not integrated into the learning experience. It's not part of the LMS, and it requires them to install software on their own PC, which isn't the most best way to create a good immersive experience for video. So Big Blue Button is a tool, it does one thing and one thing very well, which allows a student or a mentor to go to a classroom, click a button, and start a live classroom with whoever they want to share it with. It's that simple. So it's a really simple, elegant tool that's designed just for synchronous collaboration. It can be used for tutoring sessions between mentors and students. It can be used for group collaboration among students working on a final project, and a whole myriad of other things that we hope to introduce over the next couple of years. Another student-facing uh, video initiative is Kaltura. It's an open source video platform, so everyone here knows about YouTube which is a fantastic place to go upload your videos, distribute them, and share them. Uh, but YouTube is made for the masses, not so much for education. And a lot of colleges still use YouTube, but it has some limitations, uh, like LMS integration and things like that. Kaltura is going to provide us that technological backbone behind our LMS so that students or mentors can upload their own videos that they create for assignments uh, to the system and then share them out to mentors for grading or for evaluation. Um, another use case scenario that we're going to be piloting out this next year is with uh, video discussion boards. So for instance, instead of just writing a discussion board response, uh, typing it out on your computer, uh, we found that it's more engaging for students to actually do a recording of themselves, giving their response, because you get a lot more data. You get a, you get a sense of their passion about the issue. You get a sense of what's important to them. And they can share it out with their other students. And it makes responding to discussion boards more organic, which is what we want to try to encourage, instead of just encouraging text-based typing. This is a tool that students are going to grow into. So it's one thing that we'll, we'll offer the tool for a while, um, but it won't be enforced until we feel our student body is uh, ready for it. So we'll have both options available, but we believe that students will gravitate towards this as they get more familiar with the options in front of them. Pat, could you just explain Please. what LMS means? I'm sorry, uh, Learning Management System. So it's, it's the equivalent of Moodle in, our, in this case. Now another future uh, forward-thinking initiative is simulations. So right now, we, we're working on a couple simulations currently. Um, both are with vendors. Uh, so we're working on one right now at Tata Interactive, and uh, the simulation we're doing is for a nonprofit management course. And the idea behind it is that the student is a member on a board, and uh, they're working with the other board members to avert a crisis that's coming down, whether it be a fiscal crisis or something along those lines. And the decision in front of them is whether to retain or dismiss the current CEO of the nonprofit. So the student is wrestling with these other virtual avatars who are weighing in, giving their perspectives, and, integrate, and working with the student to come up to the solution, and ultimately the decision falls upon the student to retain or dismiss. 
and the consequences of that decision then play out in the simulation. So if they decide to dismiss the CEO, the next round of choices involve picking a new candidate, selecting among the other, other candidates that are available. If you decide to retain, what's going to be the plan to get the organization back on track again? And a whole slew of other things. Now one of the differences we want to do with our simulations is that they're not necessarily you did a good job or you did a bad job. We want to give them granular feedback, which means we want students to go back and work through these simulations as much as they want to because they're going to find that it's going to be difficult to get the same response twice in terms of the output. So we want to gamify these, so to speak, and make them engaging for students. So we're going to try to make these as, as formative learning experiences, not so much as just trying to get through a lab, although that's the picture here. We do have some of these as well, but that's not really the future of where simulations are going. Now we're also working with our nursing group on some of the more immersive uh, simulations, like we've worked with Lockheed Martin, with um, Shadow Health, and a few others. And as we've, we've worked with their products and with the product we're working on with Tata, um, what we've realized is there's not a lot of magic behind this. There's a lot of things that we could do in-house to save some of this money. So this is an area that we want to grow into over time to create our own simulations. And these simulations would be very expensive. Um, the nonprofit example I gave is about $50,000, whereas the nursing ones can be up to upwards of and $500,000 a piece, which is a lot of money. But the technology that's used to create these is becoming cheaper, more affordable, and the expertise needed is much more accessible than it used to be. So that's another area we're going to be heading into over the next several years. So aside from video and media, our second theme, learning outcomes. Now learning outcomes is typically seen as a very dry topic filled with compliance. Um, but it's a big issue, obviously, for colleges and institutions all across the country. Uh, we're creating right now what we're calling lovingly our AROC system, Automated Rubric Outcome Collection System. And I won't go into the details because that is a bit, uh, bit dry for this topic. Uh, but what it's going to enable us to do is collect data on how students are performing in their courses so that when they get their degree from Thomas Edison State College, we'll feel very confident when they go and apply for a job that they'll have the skills they need uh, when, they get their, when they get their new position. So all that to say, what the system does is allow us to plant in rubric elements into our ass assessments that are specifically designed to see how the student's doing on an institutional outcome of uh, diversity, let's just say, or critical thinking. And we'll be able to extrapolate that data out, which is great. It has two, two major results for the institution. One is if we have a degree program that's really reliant upon, um, I, let's take a good example, um, business and diversity. I'll just use that. Um, we'll be able to tell if our, if our students in our programs are performing at the level we want them to based on the macro level data we get from students' performance on these assignments. So we'll be able to close the feedback loop to see where these assignments are at, how can we modify them so that students can get a better uh, sense of what diverse, diversity entails so that we can improve our own curriculum. On the opposite side of this is a student-facing aspect of it. So from the student perspective, what we hope to do is use this data to identify students who are having problems with these basic core uh, outcomes and help identify them, target them, and be able to reach out and help them and assess them and more formatively before it's too late, before they actually have their degree and are moved on in life. Uh, so that's what this system will enable us to do in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I will also say that this is unique to the college because there are very few, if any, other institutions out there that are online that can do this because of our centralized design process. Uh, many times the way courses are developed elsewhere, it's a mentor, or excuse me, a faculty member developing a shell in a vacuum and then it's being polished by an instructional design team. In our model, we have complete control over our curriculum, which is fantastic. So we can implement these type of macro reaching projects into our curriculum for our students. This next one's a more fun one. Um, institutional outcome marquee courses, and you have a handout in front of you for the first one that we're planning on doing. Uh, the first course is going to be critic Critical Thinking with Video Games, a practical and playful introduction to the great ideas in intellectual history. The idea behind this course is not a course about video games. That's not the idea here. But the idea is that we want to target critical thinking as a skill so that we can help students grow and learn in that skill set within the context of games as opposed to their typical curriculum, which is, which is difficult to do. Critical thinking is probably the most difficult institutional outcome to target and assess and formatively help students in. And we believe that video games, through the immersive environment that you get and the real life simulations and contextualization of critical thinking is the way to do that. So as you read through this, this document, I'd encourage you to check it out later on, um, we're marrying traditional classic texts like Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Uh, 
and using those concepts that they're going to read about within the context of, let's just say, Minecraft or another video game. Uh, it could be as, as serious as uh, Call of Duty or Portal, things like that. Um, and that's the concept behind this. Now, we know who our students are, and many of them might not sway themselves towards video games. It might be a little, little remiss to pick up a controller. But we're designing this course using technologies like Twitch and YouTube so that students can watch others do that and respond and react. We also believe that once students get familiar with this and realize this is a no-stakes environment where we want them to participate without consequence, they'll start picking up the controller on their own. So this course hopefully will be rolled out in the first half of this next year. Um, the other hook behind this is it doesn't fit traditionally within the curriculum, so we're offering it for free to enrolled students, and it will actually bear credit. And some of the details in that are to be determined, but the idea is we want students to engage in this to give them a memorable learning experience in Thomas Edison they can look back upon and remember and think, wow, that was a great experience, and hopefully tell others about. So we want this to be a high touch and a high interactive uh, course. Oops, excuse me, wrong button. Now finally, outcomes-based student self-assessment. There's no way I can caption that to caption what this is, so I'll use the cartoon, bear with me. Uh, the cartoon says the dog is saying I'm gonna need more fe specific feedback on my formative assessments. And he has a <laughs> response from his owner saying bad dog. That's not what we're trying to shoot for necessarily, but the idea is, is sound. Uh, we're gonna be introducing, for lack of a better word, quizzes. And these are no stakes quizzes that are specifically tied back to specific college outcomes. So let's just use critical thinking as an example again. The student enrolls in a biology course. Critical thinking is gonna be assessed in the course. They take this not, no stakes test, and they don't even have to, it's really up to them. It's five questions. And they get a, re a report back saying how they did. And for sake of argument, let's just say the student did just so-so. The feedback will give them, first off, a, a list of resources they should go and brush up on, which is fine and good. But the real hook behind this is we're gonna be telling them where critical thinking is gonna be assessed in their course. So it's kind of a sneak peek as to what to be prepared for. So if written assignment number five or written assignment number eight in the final project all involve the critical thinking outcome, which you saw in the automated rubric system, we're gonna be letting them know that up front so that they know that, well, I should probably look at this so I can perform better when I get to those assignments. And uh, this is kind of a trial and error thing. We're gonna see how our students respond to it, um, but it's a very good effort to at least get some data on our students and provide them the opportunity to uh, improve if that's where they believe they should be. And finally, the third initiative, just to point out, and this is our bread and butter, course design and collaboration. Uh, we've done a lot in our unit that's not worth specifically stating out in an environment like this, in a format like this, to change how we design our courses. Uh, we've made our, 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 our course delivery systems more collaborative. Uh, they're no longer a, um, uh, 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 what's the right word, an assembly line approach where it's handoff to handoff to handoff to individual stakeholders. Now we have people working around a table. Now we have people who are collaborating with, the, with SMEs. Now we have assessment developers, working with instructional designers, working with mentors at the same time, trying to find ways to assess courses. S SMEs. Sorry, subject matter experts. <laughs> Our mentors, basically. And uh, doing that's enabled us to scale out in terms of how many courses we developed. This is just a snapshot to show, illustrate how many new courses we put out this past year. Right now we're pushing between 65 and 70. Almost all these will come to fruition before July 1st, which is fantastic. And uh, we believe our growth will be uh, continue in that same vein from here, from here onwards. Can you this last fiscal year? Yes. And the total amount of courses college offers through yeah, we're just shy of um, 600 unique courses right now, and uh, we've about 60 of those were created this year, 60 to 70, and then uh, we've actually revised about 428 courses this year. I just pulled that number recently. So we're touching our curriculum almost every course every year, which is a pretty breathtaking milestone when you consider the amount of work that actually is. And you have 100 staff, is that right? <laughs> about uh, 20, actually, <laughs> doing all this work. So, uh, so that's what I had to share, but uh, I'll welcome any questions if anyone has any. Very impressive. Okay. I, don't know, I don't know if anybody else in the country yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Matt, that's that's yeah. How many folks right now through the college are, are starting to use this? Like what, what penetration does this have right now into the student body that we have? It depends on the initiative. Like a lot of the video initiatives I talked about, we're piloting right now. We're launching them out this first and second quarter to all students. Um, but we're, target, we're doing it in a targeted way for certain programs. Like our, with our synchronous video, we're going to be launching that inside of our MBA courses in the first quarter. And so it depends on the curriculum, which is why it's a difficult thing when 
We like to make macro level change, but um, that would influence every student next month if we did that. So we have to be kind of deliberate about how we go about some of these projects. Um, but they're all at various stages. The simulation one's probably the most far reaching, but we've even got two under our belt at this point, so that it's not unrealistic. But all the other initiatives I mentioned are in the works right now. That's great. You know, I think about ways to learn for us, for many of us in the room, we may have started with uh, blackboard, chalk, transparencies. 35 millimeter slides, <laughs> maybe we got the PowerPoint. This is pretty remarkable stuff. Some people like chipped out on the cave wall, but I, mean, I, I think this is really remarkable, the marriage of the technology and the learning together. Our theme for today, really, you think about it, is the marriage of those two things together to make it a, a better outcome for folks who go through the programs. And I really like the fact that you're measuring outcomes mm -hmm. so that you can manage that process and then look for new ways to develop other things based upon those outcomes. I think that's really terrific. Right, and I would say that's actually our number one project. Out of all these I listed out here, the automated rubric system, that's our biggest priority right now. That's great. Anybody else have a question? Matt, mm -hmm. when would this course be available for board members to audit and experience? We're hoping the second quarter, so sometime around uh, October to December of this next year. That's our anticipated timeline, but we do have some more work to go. Great. That would be terrific. Yeah, yeah. Great, fantastic.